Well, welcome everybody yeah. for the commencement of this controversies conference. I've been asked to specifically talk around the burden of monogenic disorders of the kidney. Um, in the interest of time, I'll keep things moving forward at a fairly swift pace because um, there's actually quite a bit to cover. Briefly, my disclosures, uh, I have received some grants as mentioned here uh, and find myself uh, presenting to you from the tropics here in North uh, Australia. I think a really good place for us to start is to actually ask, well, where do we start um, in regards to the magnitude of monogenic kidney diseases and why in fact does this even matter? And when I was pulling this apart, really, I think that these three interlocked concepts come together around the impact of, of a condition, in this instance, monogenic kidney diseases. Um, and that uh, this relating to frequency, uh, as well as the magnitude of impact uh, that can be attributed uh, to these kind of disorders. So today I'll really be walking through evidence that has been accumulated in regards to frequency and some of the emerging evidence um, in regards to magnitude of impact of the problem. When we talk around frequency, and I do remember, you know, at the very beginning um, of my research career, which wasn't that long ago, I must confess, thankfully, um, there were a number of papers that we would all quote, and uh, many of which, you know, were published by people, uh, luminaries like uh, Professor uh, Friedhelm Hildebrandt, um, quoting an estimation of between 10 to 20 percent. And really, that was the beginning, I think, of this discussion of it was a, a kind of a, a lick one's finger, put it in the air, we think it's about 10 to 20 percent. A couple of us have then gone and measured in our discrete populations that we have access to. And here in Australia has been a fantastic uh, epidemiological laboratory really to do this, given the size of our population and, and its geographical di and uh, population diversity. And here we identified in multiple different regions fairly robustly that the proportion um, in epidemiological models at least appeared to be somewhere between 8.5 and 9.8% between Queensland as well as in Tasmania. Queensland having a base population of about 5 million and Tasmania having a base population of about 500,000 that's remained quite static um, for the past approximately 100 years. Moving from those epidemiological models more to a genetic and genomic definition of uh, genetic kidney disease or monogenic kidney disease in the population, there of course is this landmark paper um, from Grootman et al from the Garabi lab, uh, which really I think set the scene a few years ago. So in this large population of over 3000 patients in whom uh, whole exome sequencing was undertaken, uh, an estimate of about 9.3% um, was identified in a variety of genes. You know, some of the ones that were identified were not particular surprises to us all, um, but I think this was incredibly enlightening and it helps to kind of continue to correlate this, you know, nine to 10% kind of figure. Uh, moving back to, you know, well, amongst patients who you suspect have monogenic kidney disease, as opposed to at a population level, um, uh, some studies have been done of the, the, these cohorts. The first one I'd mention is this is an Australian cohort of over 200 patients uh, where in clinically suspected monogenic kidney disease, whole exome sequencing in a clinical context was undertaken and the diagnostic rate was approximately you know, 39 to 40 percent. Uh, and, and we've then seen this um, replicated in other cohorts here um, from uh, Dervla Con uh, um et, et al from Ireland um, and importantly this had begun to introduce, introduce the concept that there's actually heterogeneity amongst different diagnoses in, within the monogenic kidney disease spectrum in regards to the frequency with which a, a monogenic cause can be attributed. Our technology also continues to evolve. And I think that apart from those single point in time estimates as previously demonstrated by an Australian and an Irish cohort, um, this lovely paper um, in Kidney360 actually from uh, Washington University in North America demonstrated actually the potential yield that can be attributed to reanalysis in this same cohort. So um, uh, with fastidious clinical reanalysis, you know, potentially in up to 50% of cases um, can have a, a genetic or monogenic diagnosis attributed. Now, uh, my heuristic experience is actually quite similar to this um, and I've seen this, so it was, this was a lovely paper to be able to, um, I think, quite explicitly uh, articulate this. <laughs> 
moving to, to big scale then, you know, from these um, modestly sized but significant cohorts of, you know, uh, one to 200 patients. Across Australia, we've been very fortunate to actually be able to look at this at scale um, across our entire population base. Um, and in a cohort now that, um, apologies, it hasn't been updated, but approximately 1,100 patients now, um, our genetic diagnosis rate has remained quite steady um, at about 40 to 45%. Um, and this has remained robust from about the 500 patient mark. Um, there hasn't been really any significant change since that time. And this was in, um, data that was initially presented back in 2019 um, at ASM Kidney Week. Um, we've also been able to look because of the scale of uh, what the, the population at the different kind of genomic technologies and does this cause any difference? And importantly, all of the modern genomic sequencing technologies have quite similar diagnostic rates of about 40%. Interestingly, some of our older technologies, um, so single gene testing for single gene disorders um, and uh, copy number variation with uh, microarray type approaches actually appears to have a slightly higher uh, diagnostic yield, but that's I think another thing to discuss on another day. There is certainly enrichment by age group of onset of condition, um, and this has been well described in all cohorts. Um, for very young uh, onset, um, particularly under the age of three, but you know, really any uh, pediatric onset, um, there is an increased diagnostic rate in that group, increased likelihood of there being a monogenic cause. But a key thing in our space to recognize is that the burden of disease at a prevalent level actually remains in the adult population. So whilst there's much heightened incidence in the pediatric population, the bulk of prevalence actually still remains in the adult population and there's still monogenic diagnoses there to be attributed. Moving back to the different diagnostic groupings, um, as uh, Dervla had shown in her uh, Irish publication, in KI, um, we saw similar things um, at scale. And certainly some of these diagnoses, it's unsurprising that for Alport syndrome and cystic disorders and tubular disorders, the diagnostic rates were higher than in other disorders. Um, some disorders performed almost quite um, uh, disappointingly, one would say, um, uh, compared to others. Um, and I think that this is an experience that's been replicated uh, at a global scale. So when we come to thinking through this, you know, I, I do love this um, figure from the CJASON series last year, because it really so brings together the core concepts around frequency that are important for, for us all as take homes. Um, the things that amplify genetic risk or the likelihood of an individual having uh, a monogenic cause for their kidney disease are the presence of extra renal features, the younger age of onset, some specific subtypes of their kidney disease, as well as having a positive family history. And the diagnostic yield can vary. Uh, and it is so important for us to have a grasp on this uh, when we're both ourselves trying to have an expectation of a diagnostic test, um, as well as counselling our patients in regards to that as well. So bringing this together to try and work out, well, well what is the real estimate and what do we really say in terms of frequency? Um, there is a complex interplay. So at a population level with purely clinical clinical definitions of a diagnosis, you know, the diagnostic rate's about 10% uh, approximately. And, and then using a purely genomic estimate, it's also about 10%, but where we know that in amongst those where there's a clinically a suspected diagnosis of a genetic or monogenic kidney disease, actually the genomic diagnosis rate's only about at best, perhaps 50% and in, in reality, just a little lower than that. So are there unappreciated cases? at a population level in terms of our coding and attributing of diagnoses? And are there perhaps coming from a genomic angle, are there misdiagnosed cases, cases that are truly of a monogenic nature that we've actually instead called something else? And I think that this is a really important point because the idea of what the actual truth is, is still a little veiled to us, but at least it's beginning, beginning to be unpicked. Moving from the concept of frequency to magnitude, the way that I'll talk about magnitude is around clinical utility as a reflection of it. And importantly, this is a very multi-dimensional space. So in terms of utility, the way that I uh, and some of my colleagues here in Australia have been thinking about this is in regards to the, the time frame of the particular form of utility that you're talking about, the domain. So is this around family planning uh, or uh, kidney biopsy or a specific treatment? And also the relationship of the person in whom that utility is occurring to perhaps the test 
stressful outcome. Uh, so whether that's the person who's affected or a, a family member or a friend or, or, or loved one, um, I think cumulatively all of these things together are what we call utility, but obviously it's a vast constellation within. In terms of building evidence around what this looks like, some of the implementation publications are looking at the commencement of uh, clinical monogenic kidney disease or genetic kidney disease services really begin to help us to unpack this. So in this fantastic paper um, from North America, from Boston, from memory, uh, they were able to begin to see things like um, a proportion of pa patients having family members cleared to donate. Um, and I believe there was also some look in here around cost utility, um, uh, as well as personal utility around timeframes, which is so important in this space too. Moving to the family planning aspect, uh, this uh, fantastic paper from the Netherlands um, has begun to unpack, well, what is happening in this space um, in monogenic kidney disease and what's the uptake and what's the, um, the actual impa impact that's been seen. Now, this is uh, obviously as a universal healthcare model with a very mature marketplace um, and series of clinical services, um, I think is very informative for many of us. Um, in my experience, uh, whilst offered to many, the uptake is low, but that's in a circumstance, particularly in Australia, where uh, the public funding for pre-implantation uh, genetic testing um, uh, and assisted reproductive technologies is a little more complex, perhaps. And, and I imagine that in many of your areas of around the world, um, there are similar intricacies as well that may impact also on the ability to appreciate utility. A really interesting study that I, I had the pleasure to be involved with last year was actually looking at something called parental spillover effects, which is a coming from a health economics and utility perspective is a, a fascinating concept to try and understand what are the impact upon say parents and families as a result of um, illness in a, a child or or loved one. Um, here in Australia, given uh, we have a national consortium around uh, genomic implementation, the Australian Genomics Health Alliance, uh, they were able to look at different cohorts of children with multiple different clinically significant monogenic disorders. And genetic kidney disease was one, along with mitochondrial epileptic, uh, epileptic encephalopathy and other uh, brain malformations like lipid dystrophy. When they looked at the spillover effects, the impact actually in genetic kidney diseases was actually higher than in some of the neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, which was actually for us a great surprise because obviously the instrumental disability experienced by many of those children with some of the neurodevelopmental conditions um, would appear to be greater uh, than some of the children with genetic kidney diseases. And secondarily, seeing the impacts upon families uh, in terms of their, uh, their experience of quality of life was uh, quite a big surprise, even for the, those for us who are actually quite close to the area. Moving to different applications of utility from a diagnostic angle, um, this was a fantastic paper um, looking at uh, the application of diagnostic genomics in patients waiting kidney transplantation. Um, and I thought that this was really fascinating to try and look at, well, was there a dish, were there additional diagnoses? So diagnostic utility is the domain of interest here. Um, and in fact, uh, there, were, uh, there were cases able to be found um, in the undetermined group. Um, obviously those who already had an attributed hereditary disorder, it picked many of them up clearly, but in the undetermined group, there were additional diagnoses to be identified. Here uh, in a, another large scale study, this is actually being replicated at scale um, uh, and I think that uh, is likely to become an emerging indication given the utility that we're beginning to see. Using a genetics first approach um, in end stage kidney disease patients under the age of 50 and this is a paper that's currently in press at the present time. Um, there, this was a, a study in the Netherlands that actually identified um, how in the real world application of genomic sequencing was able to identify new diagnoses in uh, you know, a typically messy and complicated patient population. And I don't say that in any disrespectful way to anybody. Actually, I say that with utmost respect because that's the reality um, of our practice. Patients come in all of their, their forms and um, circumstances. Um, and our role is to use the tools that we have to try and disentangle the, the situation from a diagnostic angle. 
some of the diagnoses that were I found were quite interesting um, and uh, informative, I think, for clinicians around, uh, particularly from a histological and other perspective. Um, and the fact that six reclassifications were identified amongst this large cohort of transplant patients, I think is still quite significant and helps us to identify where the diagnostic utility of application um, for these kinds of uh, tools and tests may actually lie. So through those studies, really, there are two major dimensions which have been studied to date, and there's evidence. In the diagnostic utility space, that's really now kind of quite established for suspected cases of monogenic kidney disease and beginning to be stretched in new uh, indications, such as uncertain forms of uh, kidney disease, uh, particularly when younger and more advanced. The clinical utility is frequently inferred. So we've all seen, I think, different publications and reports which infer that everybody benefited and the evidence base for that perhaps is, is a little opaque at times. Um, I think that measurement and further investigation in this space is clearly required because it's a really complex space. It's very hard to work out the different domains of utility and importantly, there isn't a clear ut utility ontology for us to apply that will help us to understand this uh, moving forward. But it is a, this is, I think, the next horizon for us to uh, uh, put significant work to as genomics hits the road, so to speak, in clinical practice. What also comes next, uh, and I think that in a conference like this, it's so important to mention the interplay potentially between obviously monogenic kidney disease on a background of polygenic kidney disease. And this is also a space which will impact utility and frequency estimations over time because we all see phenotypic fluidity and also genotype fluidity uh, within our populations. And there will be an impact on translatability and also our estimations of burden that will come from this. But increasingly, much like a wormhole, as I've represented here, monogenic and polygenic kidney disease are intrinsically interconnected. And in our practice over time, uh, this will become clearer. At the moment, I think we're only at the dawn of beginning to understand this. Um, and uh, it, it, we don't yet obviously have clinical tools to help us to translate that. But um, I think that over the next one, perhaps two decades, given the speed of things, this will help us quite significantly understand variability within the space. Beginning to summarize, I think that, you know, in regards to the burden of monogenic kidney diseases, you know, when we're looking at this idea of impact as a broad concept, and um, as I've walked through with frequency approximately at this time, as it, I think we've landed back where we started, um, you know, where um, Professor Hildebrandt told us we, what this really was, I think in many of his publications, uh, around approximately a 10 to 20% proportion of chronic kidney disease having a, a monogenic basis. Um, what are the causes for that gap? Uh, between epidemiological and genomic estimates, and we have ongoing evolving understanding in this space. But it is it's fascinating that we've ended up where we started, but with a lot more proof um, as to exactly what's going on. In regards to magnitude, whilst we have proven diagnostic utility, the clinical utility angle is emerging. And this is a space where obviously I think quite significant on ongoing understanding is required. And, and coming from this space where obviously there are clear some gaps in our understanding, uh, that's a fantastic basis for which obviously to launch into a controversies conference like this. Um, and I hope you enjoy the conference and uh, look forward to touching base with many of you um, throughout and of course afterwards.